before the steel was formed for the Golden Gate Bridge, it was regarded by many as the bridge that could not be built. But it was indeed built. Built in a spectacular fashion. It stands 746 feet tall, spans 8,981 feet, and is known for its distinctive international orange color. The bridge is made of over 83,000 tons of steel, each of the two towers constructed of 600,000 rivets. In the fabricating shops of the Bethlehem Steel Company at Pottstown and Steelton, Pennsylvania, the fabrication work begins. Bethlehem, the major contractor, will build the steel towers and suspended span of the bridge. Huge sections, formed and temporarily assembled at the shops, are disassembled and shipped by rail to the Philadelphia docks. It takes miles of railroad cars to carry the steel for the towers and suspended span. At Philadelphia, the sections are loaded aboard ships of Bethlehem's Kalmar Line for the long trip to San Francisco by way of the Panama Canal. And finally, through the Golden Gate into San Francisco Bay. The steelwork is unloaded at Bethlehem's facilities at Alameda, across the bay from San Francisco. Here, the sections of the bridge are stored to be shipped out to the construction site in sequence. At the Golden Gate, construction begins with a Marin Pier. When the last of the concrete has been poured on the North Pier, its surface is ground to a true plane. This is to ensure that the steel superstructure will start true and plumb. The surface is made plain to within less than one thirty-second of an inch. The towers, which will be erected on each pier, are identical. 702 feet of steel rising to an elevation of 746 feet above sea level. Two legs joined together by six cross braces. The legs are 90 feet apart on centers. Clearance between the legs at deck level is 60 feet, the width of the six-lane roadway. When the bridge is completed, there will be no other structure this tall between San Francisco and New York City. Moving the steel from storage at Alameda to the bridge site is a sizable effort in logistics. The distance is five miles across the open water of the bay. The obstacles to navigation are wind, tide, storm, and the famous San Francisco fog. To avoid delays in erection whenever bad weather prevents deliveries, a small storage area is prepared at the tower site to hold enough materials for several days' work. The lowermost sections of the tower are anchored to vertical steel angles which have their roots 53 feet below the surface of the pier. These angles are pre-stressed before riveting to the tower legs, so they will exert a downward pull on the tower, a safeguard against the stresses of wind and earthquake. As the erection traveler raises itself on the lower tower sections, its spider-like shape stands out against the water. Each of its two electric-powered stiff-legged derricks is rated at 85 tons, about the weight of the heaviest tower section. Once the traveler clears the pier by a sufficient margin, the workmen begin erection of the first diagonal brace, and so the technique of building the tower proves its workability. As the tower progresses upward, the traveler erects the tower legs, then raises itself and builds the braces behind it. One red-hot rivet coming up, special delivery to men working by the light of miners' lamps inside the tower. The riveters work on double platform scaffolding, driving simultaneously on several levels. While the net did save the lives of 19 men who became known as the Halfway to Hell Club, 11 men did die during construction. The first fatality was Kermit Moore on October 21, 1946.
1936. When compared to other large construction projects at the time, this was actually less than expected. There are many special provisions for the safety of the men during erection. For example, for protection against head injuries, the workmen wear hard hats. And whenever they can work with limited movement, the men use safety belts with tie-off lines. As the year 1934 unfolds, a bold silhouette rises above the Golden Gate. The horizontal cross struts above the roadway level will help the tower legs act as a unit in resisting lateral forces. For the top of each tower leg, there is a massive cable saddle cast at Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Each saddle is a three-piece steel casting. They are mounted on rollers to allow movement during erection of the span. Later, they will be fixed in position. All things considered, this pier and fender wall represent one of the most difficult underwater construction feats ever attempted. The pier was successfully completed in January of 1935. It took about a year and a half. As the tower progresses upward, Kalmar Line ships continue their deliveries of fabricated steelwork to Alameda. The pattern of erecting the San Francisco Tower is the same as that used in building the Marin Tower. The San Francisco Tower is completed by late June, 104 days ahead of schedule. On November 11, 1935, the task of spinning the two great cables is begun. From then on, the Golden Gate is steadily bridged wire by wire. The workmen of the cable contractor stitch the north and south shores together with 80,000 miles of wire. Each wire measures just under one-fifth of an inch in diameter, slightly smaller than a lead pencil. Spinning carriages shuttle from anchorage to mid-span, playing out as many as six wires on each trip. The cables, when completed, will weigh 22,000 tons apiece. It's interesting to note that each cable weighs approximately as much as each tower. The wires, 27,572 of them per cable, build up to a compacted cable slightly over three feet in diameter. Later, as the roadway takes shape, the cables will be wrapped with galvanized wire and painted to protect them against the elements. The spinning of the cables is completed in May of 1936. Bethlehem, builder of the towers, begins erecting the suspended span on June 18th. The entire span would be constructed from elementary structural forms. The stiffening truss panels would consist of top and bottom cords, diagonals, and verticals. The verticals are spaced at 25-foot intervals. Suspender strands occur at every other vertical. The truss measures 28 feet deep. The roadway floor beams are eight and a half feet deep, 87 feet long, and weigh, on the average, 23 tons each. Generally speaking, the floor beams occur at each vertical in the stiffening trusses. Roadway stringers atop the floor beams carry the 60-foot roadway. Knee braces tie in the floor beams and bottom cords. The summer of 1936 
sees the first three panels erected by cantilevering each way from the towers. Chicago booms at the roadway level handle the steel for this work. One of the unique features of the job is the emphasis placed on safety. As the roadway moves outward from each tower, a manila rope safety net is introduced. Assembled first at water level, the net and its frame are lifted to position beneath the span. Eventually, the net will extend the entire length of the bridge. Also, the net reaches some 10 feet beyond the width of the span on each side. As erection proceeds, the first three panels of roadway are planked over. The steelwork is delivered from Alameda to the base of the towers, then hoisted to this planked over area. From there, the steel members move out on a buggy to the point of construction. After the first three panels are planked over, the balance of the span erection is handled by traveler derricks. In the erection of the trusses, two 25-foot panels are cantilevered forward, assembled piece by piece. The first vertical is joined to the projecting bottom cord. The diagonals are then erected, followed by the top cord. And so the span progresses, moving out truss by truss in four directions to maintain equal loading on the cables and towers. When each set of two truss panels is connected to the suspenders, the floor beams are swung into place. These will be followed by reinforcing laterals and some of the roadway stringers. By fall of 1936, residents of San Francisco are treated to the sight of a span which moves steadily closer to the day when the two halves will meet. The partial loading of cables and towers gives the span an unnatural curvature. It looks as though the main span will meet at a peak. Bethlehem and the cable contractor work together to control the cable curvature and saddle movements. Finally, on November 18, 1936, the closing members are lowered into place. The Golden Gate is bridged. For Chief Engineer Joseph Strauss, and for every engineer who has contributed to the work, this is a day of realization, the type of day which fulfills the life of an engineer, first as a dream, then as a magnificent accomplishment. But the job is far from over. Painters apply the final coat, a special color prepared for this bridge, International Orange by name. The buggies bring out fabricated sections for the sidewalks and railings. These items and the balance of the roadway stringers are erected as the traveler derricks work their way back to the towers. Bethlehem Steel's role in building the bridge is coming to an end, a role that involved the fabrication and erection of close to 70,000 tons of steelwork. When the derricks and other structural tools are removed, the paving contractor installs and welds the reinforcing steel for the concrete roadway. This web of steel will transmit traffic loads to the stringers. Far 
fog makes one of its regular visits as the finishing touches are added to the bridge, creating a strange kind of beauty. And so, the work is completed. The bridge that pessimists said could not be built has been built. May 28, 1937. Opening day. It was a celebration worthy of the bridge. The fact that men who never saw a blueprint or drove a ribbit were so deeply proud of the accomplishments proved that all men are builders at heart conquerors of the impossible. But some men, the engineers, earn and cherish the privilege of doing the dreaming, the planning, the building. It was such men who designed and built the Golden Gate Bridge. 